The Imperiod by Il Barrio. Book One The Sleep of the Gods. For love and the destiny of man, I sing of those compelled by fate to fulfill the goddess's journey and lift an atlas weight. In the house of Priam, forward bring those beleaguered sons of Troy who flood across the Aegean Sea, harried by the unfathomable hatred of Queen Juno and the accursed sorrow of Greek-led tragedy, set adrift on Neptune's seas of floating human cargo, suffering beyond all measure to Lavinian shores, surmounting brutal wars and many foes to found a home once more, have at hand one final test greater than all that have come before, before claiming their well-earned rest. O muse into Apollo, sun god who sees beyond all, whose beloved lineage this telling does attest to follow, through peril and great toil, I pray for the merit to recall how the empire finally ended and the gods themselves did fall. Book Two, The Fall of Rome. Let no joyful voice be heard, sing no merry song. For Rome of ancient glory be dead, the gods have come and gone. A new purpose now fills the hearts of man, a dreadful, bitter one. A crusade against the ancient plan, they lie prostrate before the sun. Baptized in blood, through sword and shield, in every manner of pain, a rage has come, unlike any other scene. From papal palace they wield their reign, ushering in the darkest age, an unholy kingdom. For this they fight, to this is what they kneel. In the name of their deity, an unholy war they wage. It is in these times of cursed fight, when all that is good does reel in which our story shall unfold, released from memory's cage, for in the darkest hour of night there is the turning of the page. Book Three, Horatio's Quest. Horatio woke from his dream, his head torn, still spinning, groggy from the vividness of his apparition, his chest still sore from where Cupid's arrow had stung, the rest all around silent in the early morning air, except for the sound of swallows in their nest, chirping outside his window, waking there to the new day's light. He might, as often happens, simply shake the sleep from his hair and let be forgotten the vision of the night. If not for the proof lying there by his side, a sword glimmering and bright. In the blade sharpened to a fault, his reflection did shine back upon him, lifting it by the hilt, unable to believe his eyes. Heavy in the hand, standing square and still, the sword of Troy before him, ready to do his will. Book Four, Raid of the Barbary Corsairs. Arriving in Naples, a first to his eyes, Horatio stared out in wonder at this Renaissance seat. In every direction, a spring of vitality energized the teeming populace as they haggled to compete for the latest wares, arriving on merchant vessels from Pisa and Genoa and faraway Crete. The markets they bustled, while under the shadow of the castle, the port busily unloaded more goods. No stranger to turmoil, the kingdom of Naples was the center of shifts in regional power, and it be understood that in time, all that comes will too one day be gone. For the moment, from there where he stood, Horatio could see flying the colors of the Order of the Dragon, from the house of Trastamara, surrounded by Gothic architecture, sat Alfonso I, ruler of Naples and King of Aragon. These were the times of upheaval, discovery, and adventure, a perfect place Horatio thought to commence his new venture. Book 5 In the Service of Rais al Khan. Seven years be a long time to wait, but longer still pushing an oar with no hope of escape. If this truly be the path the gods had in store, if somehow it all be part of the plan, then he had no choice but to follow, for it was controlled by destiny's hand. 
The first year was the hardest. He worked back-breaking hours more than ever before. His service was not just a test. Constantly under a watchful eye, being driven greater than all of the rest, fearing that one mistake might cost him his life, there was no option then to give it his all. Yet in his heart, through all of the strife, he never once forgot his pledge to the goddess's call. Regardless of what may come, in that duty never would he fall. The crescent moon was a ship like no other, more than a galley, a gallius it was known. The Turks called it a Mahone. Ahead of its time, the fastest ship on the sea, it was said to be of Rice Al Khan's own design, with multiple decks and masts numbering three. It had 32 oars, 16 to a side, and 50 guns, 23 port and starboard each, with two fore and aft, the only on the water to cover its behind. No other had such a deadly, terrible reach. It made port in Algiers, Rabat, and Tripoli, and all along the Barbary coast, in each selling what they stole for a handsome fee, with 10% of the share going to the Sultan as homage, the standard duty for all ships of the fleet. Hunting for treasure, Christian slaves, and all that they can, it was run by a crew of bloodthirsty pirates to the very last man. Book 6, The Battle of Algiers. Up the winding hillside they climbed, Rice navigating the twisting alleyways all by memory. The bell of Aden then chimed as they came through a passageway to a large public square. Suddenly their momentum gave way to a massive supplication where hundreds of bodies turned towards the east all falling into line. Mid-morning prayer, Suleiman whispered in Horatio's ear as Rice and he joined in the ceremony of touching their foreheads to the ground, reciting the ritual prayers four times each. Horatio had of course already seen this around the ship and was familiar with the daily homage. This however was quite different from anything he'd previously found. An entire city stopping in mid-stride, people of all ranks and ages together lowering their heads to the sun here in the heights of Algiers. It began by standing, touching hands to the ears with the words Awa Akaba, God is great, on their lips for themselves alone to hear. Hands on chest, they continued the rakah, quoting scriptures from the Quran, bowing, then three times did they iterate, Glory to my Lord, the most magnificent, and standing again, Allah listens and responds to the one who praises him. Then, Rabbana wa alaka alamd. O oh, our Lord, and all praise is for you. Now lying prostrate with head and palms upon the ground. Glory to my Lord, the Most High, most praiseworthy, three times they do. From whence they sit before again lying down for another round. When complete, they sit once more, recite a prayer, then stand and repeat. For the final rakah, while sitting on the ground, to the right, then the left, a blessing do they offer from their seat. May Allah grant you peace and security, and upon you may his mercy be. Seven, at war. Having reached the Ottoman seat in Constantinople, now renamed Istanbul, conferring with the power elite and Mehmed II, the Sultan directly adding fuel to his story for the urgency of action, Captain Raisel Khan became the center of the whirlpool. Mehmed II, known as the Conqueror, already desired an expansion of his empire further to the west and this timely arrival set off a chain reaction. Khan was commended, his vision blessed, backed by additional resources. The Barbary Corsairs now had official sanction to pillage and rest as much as they could capture from the Christian spheres of influence. 
Khan himself, protected by letters of mark, was named admiral and granted authority over all other pirate vessels to direct and embark into battle as representative of the monarch. Book 8. The Siege of Monombasia. The garrison of Maleo, the town seat of Monombasia, was standing on high alert with watches doubled at the gate and tower peaks, all eyes set on the ships of the Ottoman Turks, preparing to repel their pending invasion. Are we sure of this? The despot Thomas seemed irked from his throne behind the high-walled fortification. Yes, your majesty, confirmed his deputy. Our source was very clear. Very well, then. Make it so, he confirmed his sanction. And for the terms of the engagement? The deputy drew near in a muffled tone. Yes, yes, it is acceptable, Thomas exhaled, playing the cards he was dealt, feeling himself the poor gambler. With word that his brother Demetrius was taken prisoner, having failed to properly defend his lands, Monombasia was one of the last holdouts, and barring a miracle, surrounded, he too may find himself jailed, or worse. That he would not let happen. Giving benefit to his doubt, a pact he would seal to hold on to what remained of his clout. Book 9. Escape. All the storms were now converging, a cyclone of sweat and blood and flesh in every direction, swirling, surging, rallying each to his own mesh. Three camps were in disarray, nothing had gone according to sketch. Scuttled, the garrison of Maleo, in lieu of reinforcing Mendez as ordered, retreated from the walls to seal the entranceway, concerned more with being cornered, with Ali and foe dressed in the same manner, closing the gate most importantly factored. For his own part, Mendez, in a clamor, with a gaping wound and left eye cut from socket, was delirious with pain, could barely stammer, and fell unconscious when a hot coal was brought to seal the pocket. His men would be leaderless for twice an hour held on the docket. Book 10 From the Depths as mighty Neptune slept beneath those Ionian waves, the body of Khan made its descent from where the deck of the crescent moon gave an honor and offering to both the man and the god at their rightful tributes. Wrapped in fine linens fit for the grave, the weighted corpse sank deeper into the abyss. As a seed pod, it entered the coral domain of where untold creatures of the sea lurk. There, in the deep blue sea, a rippling tremor through the currents plod as Neptune stirred and in so doing laid the groundwork for a cascading chain of events. For all of Brother Pluto's plodding work, he still could not control the oceans, and though Neptune sent along with the Olympian gods into a hibernating slumber, the Oceanids and other sea nymphs were still virulent. In an anarchistic sort of way, each following their natural tumbler, they helped to maintain the fluid flow of order. Book 11, The Ghosts of Malta. In that trailing dusk, with the final specks of daylight mingling with the sea air's musk, a spot of land presented itself to light upon the horizon. I know that island, Suleiman spoke, catching sight of the silhouetted strip of land. It's Malta, a Christian stronghold, and the limit of Aragon's reach. Our best plan would be to sail around past her dark folds. Agreed. Horatio confirmed his right hand's opinion. Keep her to our flank, he gave his orders as the wind gusts cold. I, Suleiman confirmed from behind the helm's bastion, setting his course with the dark of night slowly enveloping the waters. From the ship's railing came a voice raised in whispering fashion that caught Horatio's ear, drawing him in close as would do squatters, for Kasim was recalling to Issa and Nebi a tale he once heard of these quarters. That island is haunted, they say. He began, his voice raw with scruff gravity.
Book 12, The Underworld. Meanwhile, in the underworld, Lord Pluto was living in style. Never before had so much tribute been unfurled before his feet. If maybe not on every lip, he was never far from mind. As the world's populace curled into religion, he became that much more important. The biting end of the whip that set people into motion. From his domain, he controlled the strings, pulling the world from left to right according to whim, as he saw fit the lives of men on earth, his playthings. From up above, there was nothing, only silence, leaving up to man's interpretation the meaning of things. Fallible, they shaped theology to suit their own structures of violence, leaving Pluto, by whisper or direct involvement, to mold the world to his image. Reaping from the fields of battle the spoils of blood and rising pestilence, his kingdom continued to expand to cover the earth in a sorrowful age, one in where wars unending roiled with rage. Book 13, A Return to Carthage On fortune's wings they flew, over the open sea, with the wind at their stern, and spirits running high. The crescent moon and her crew skirted the Christian sphere of influence. Setting a course northwestern, they trimmed sail to make the most of the prevailing air current. Steady on! Horatio felt the wind stream through his hair as he turned to look upon the horizon. If they kept their pace going at the present rate, they'd make the Tyrrhenian by nightfall and hopefully pass undetected up the Italian coastline. Captain, Suleiman on an aside asked for a moment, is it true you search out the doorway to the afterworld that selected for a mission have you been by the gods you worship no less? There was a deeper question lingering unspoken, yet still detected in the air. Horatio regarded his friend and first mate, sure of the duress that must weigh with some of the crew on the course chosen for the ship. Got no choice but to trust them's guarding your back, Khan would often stress. In the end, though, they're all a bunch of cutthroats who throw you to the fish. So regardless the yarn you care to weave, remember to press the point of profit. Book 14, Dido's Curse. Around his neck, the stone of red returned to black. For the moment, it seemed that danger had been put in check. Quickly, the brothers retracing their path to the harbor made their way back to their ship, the Crescent Moon, where the crew was busily making repairs. Captain, Issa spoke for the pair. We must sail with all haste. Fearing attack, they pulled Horatio aside, relaying the encounter that caused them such cares. Telling the story about the gypsy girl and her gifts, they then recounted the following of Jamel, and what then befell tracing him to secret lairs. Entering from the rear of the building, I observed them undetected, Issa began his report. I saw that traitor talking low with three Spaniards, one a ranking officer, the other two his adjutants, from what he counted. And so the Spanish know we're here, Horatio considered those cards. That's unfortunate for sure, though I doubt they dare to make a strike in such a fortified harbor. Nay, sir, there's more. Iso's voice broke to shards. They seemed little interested until he mentioned your heritage. Then, like a pike, they became rigid with attention, taking a stance serious and businesslike. A Trojan? asked their leader, a great significance he placed on those words. We must deal with this at once, he told the others, and that's when it began. Book 15 Chaos and Balance Run! The gypsy's voice echoed in his head as Horatio and the rest thoroughly unstrung regained their senses. With the entire square in disarray, on foot they fled. This way, she guided their escape. 
The six scrambled across the square, disappearing into the throng towards the exits the rushing multitudes led, pulling the escapees along in the current. Horns blowing in alarm did blare too late as they exited the citadel walls, making quick of pace their flight. What just happened there? Horatio questioned on the run as they teared down the outlying slopes. And who are you? He wanted to know all right. This is the girl we told you about, Nebby offered up the solution. That's the second time she's helped us today, Issa said, shedding some light. Why, though? Horatio needed to know how came about this evolution. What's going on here? What were those creatures? Those are fear and dread. She spoke of the two by attribution. By the names Timor and Formido they are known. Demonic spirits, curs from the afterworld risen, shapeshifters who can take on many features. Yet they are only a precursor, for much greater evil is still to come. In the shadows lurking close by hides their master who will lead us to an unending war. Only you can stop him. Book 16, The Ides of War. As all the preceding fanned, the despot Thomas was making port in the famed Kingdom of Naples. The city-state's defense is already in a clamor as the regional barons panned the succession of Ferdinand I to the throne and marched to topple the monarch. Led by John of Anjou, who with the help of the Genoese landed troops in the south, capturing countryside towns that were staples to the kingdom's riches, a definitive battle was brewing to crescendo for these two competing forces. Send an envoy, Thomas commanded as they docked. Announce our arrival with letters of good conduct signed by His Excellency and Holiness Pope Pius II, their mutual benefactor. Jolted, the ship rocked into position as lashings were made to the long wharf. See, at once, senor, the captain nodded, now in safe harbor. Prepare an escort, he knocked upon the floorboards with the toe of his boot. Presently I'll be going ashore. When I do, you shall await further orders. I may still have need of your vessel. Do nothing until you hear from me, is that clear? And the captain, see, senor. Though a rightful sovereign, Thomas knew that on Italian soil he was the vassal and would do well to keep his options open as the dust was yet to settle. Book 17 Luck of the Gods through the rolling mist, breaking a path over foam-clad cresting waves that burst silently menacing, stalking the future as the ever-looming apocalypse, came the towering forecastle and mighty pale arc of Hannibal's thirst. Sailing from Carthage upon the darkest hour, she longed for the taste of blood, the scent of her prey guiding the helmsman's hand as the heavens cursed. At the prow stood her master, the god of war, who with a boot-heeled thud upon the deck set his eye to the horizon. That way, he inhaled deeply, savoring the tang of haste and sweat that mixed with the flood of sea salt on the air. They're out there, just ahead of us, obliquely, I can feel them. The helmsman adjusted course to come in line with the direction Mars had set. When caught, the price would be steeply paid, for once embarked upon, war could not so easily confine itself, but instead would spread to every corner with carnage and destruction. None were safe who crossed into this realm. Bring me more wine, Mars called to his steward, his hunger swelling with a gnawing seduction as his sword hand itched to fulfill its own primary function. Ah, look at those streaks of scarlet, he eyed the first light of day as a good omen while pulling back a long swig from his goblet. Hunting season is upon us, he gave a broad smile. Rouse the men, let them know there's knife work to be done today. He sent off his servant. That'll raise their spirits, eh? 
He turned to his second who shared an amen. It will indeed. Timor made his own declaration equally fervent. All will tremor before us, Formido likewise echoed. They shall perish. He spoke as the three readied for battle with eyes to the skyline, observant to the direction in which fled their quarry. These were the moments to cherish, with all the day's possibilities before them, contemplating their pending wrath. There, there she is, Mars bellowed, pointing standing tall and squarish as a speck several leagues away dented the horizon's lineal path. Prepare ye demons. Formido hissed at the crew, eyes locked on their target as the finger puppets of the dam riled, anticipating the coming bloodbath. Shall we play with our food before we dine? Mars, standing upon the parapet, considered the mouse, and in a feisty mood, he decided to affix his helmet. Book 18 Ancient History Affixing Pluto's helmet, Horatio felt a tingling sensation, as if every fiber of his body were beset by living energy. Concealing you from observation, Isfet oriented him with the legendary powers of this fortunate gift. It will also envelop that which carries the wearer, making infiltration a simple act. If dressed in this you stand close to any other, you may drift a whisper in the ear, planting a subconscious suggestion in their head, shaping ideas and opinions, manipulating foe and friend alike to open a rift or seal one as you like. So you are saying, Horatio followed the thread, that right now the entire ship is protected? Yes, we are all invisible, Isfit confirmed. As long as the bearer is aboard ship, within this bulkhead, none may detect our passing. Jupiter be praised. How is this possible? Horatio asked rhetorically. Nothing from on high, Isfet gave her surety, telling of the Titan Wars. This helmet was born of the darkest arts devisable. During the war with the Titans, the Cyclops gifted the brothers three mighty tools. Jupiter was given thunder, Neptune his trident, and Pluto invisibility. There's more. The scratching voice of Mott pressed her sister. Tell them the entire story of all that came before. Book 19. Vulcan's Gate. With Fortune's guiding hand having helped them narrowly escape ruin, a duty was still required from the fleeing Corsair band to honor their newly fallen lost in battle. Wrapped in cloth, each in turn would be committed to the sea, a burial tribute befitting departed seamen. The sun was setting a deep orange off their port angle, a moment to adjourn the dead. May you find peace, dear brothers, Horatio led the Requiem, as one after another were released to embark upon their final voyage. For the last, Avernos, impaled through the chest with his own arrow, beaten by a god no less, Horatio paused the bearers. With two coins for passage, he placed them secure upon the bandaged eyes. Fathers may not believe, but for you, my Thracian friend, I will see you again in Elysium. With leverage, the body slid into the sea, joining the rest as it sunk beneath the water's heave. With the final salute, Horatio brought his attention back to matters pressing. Bosun, bring us about True North, he instructed the helm to weave into position. Aye, sir, True North, Suleiman adjusted course, dressing the wheel to bring them to a line that would keep the enemy guessing. Book 20, Athalia. 
The sky broke red, a maroon as ever there was, each morning at the same hour tread, with plum embossing underneath and silver bed, t'was an ominous way to start the day in paradise. As the first light reflecting off of the precious metal deposits lining the eastern shores would cause a spectrum of orange, red, and burgundy to light upon the clouds, flecking the sky with passionate color. Slowly the morning broke across tranquil sandy beaches, up rocky eucalyptus slopes, with wild flowers specking the rolling rugged mountainsides to peak a thousand meters high, a triangle to the heavens. Thus Athalia woke. Prepare the landing party, Horatio called his best men forward. Balak and Ecti stood swords ready to wrangle, as did the powerful buttress and the twins Issa and Nebi likewise installed. Equally, too, Suleiman would not be divided. By his captain's side, he was fixed. At his shoulder, Isfit didn't need to remind him of her words as he recalled. To the very gates of hell. Promise made, the soundtrack of his mind remixed. Pausing, Horatio took notice of this moment, gratefully transfixed. Book 21, Gargoyle Pass. Venus had many ways of eluding her husband. Thus, knowing how his sense of scent plays heavily into her affairs, she employed nature's device of spreading jasmine throughout her pleasure garden, which stays her trail invisible to Vulcan's insidious sniffing while she enjoyed her vice. This here was the reason and cause of the delay, as the pair of Brimley brothers stood confused before the labyrinth of passageways. It would be rolling dice to choose an entrance. What's the holdup? Mars upon them hovers. I can smell neither fear nor haste. Formido growls in frustration. We can't smell anything beyond these creeping weeds of mothers. Timor tried to clear his sinus of the fragrant shrub's menstruation to no avail. Move aside! Mars brushed away the pair with his hand, seeing that the circumstance would require his personal mediation. Dropping to all fours, he closed his eyes and slowed his breath and put his ear to the earth, allowing the way before him to expand. Book 22 Lilith Rising Meanwhile, on an entirely different plane, Pluto was busy plotting to beguile yet another wayward soul into his misadventure. Here he came, to the bowels of Babylon, standing before a dark castle overgrown with thorns. Jackals scoured the haunches, while haunting at the edges of the dismal frame, ostriches ducked and buried their heads in the sand. Howling wind scorns the battlements, thick with thistles and briars. Satyrs can be heard whispering to one another in the shadows, as wildcat beasts stalk the night. An owl adorns the great mantle, quietly watching, guarding her eggs. With torches flickering, shadow and light off her unblinking eyes, she tucks into the secure obscurity of her perching lair on high. Out of respect, the jackal started <laughs> snickering. Here it was that Pluto, the lord of the underworld, would set to test the purity of faith, for here, in the dark and deserted recesses, is where he would find her. Outcast and forgotten, temptress of the night, seductress of all impurity, here was where Lilith, the first woman of Earth, did now reside. Too sure of female for mortal men, she became a spirit of the night, a sultry whisper.
Book 23, The Finding of Pluto's Shrine. Mars took a step forward. Ah, how I've missed you, my sweet Capitolina, he called the she-wolf creature by name. Coming toward her with a free hand extended, he stepped into her arena. With a look of recognition, the she-wolf bowed and nuzzled. With a friendly growl, she welcomed her master, yielding to subpoena. I see you've been busy, he looked around in a questioning manner, puzzled by the surroundings. What have you been up to? Scratching the back of her ear, Mars released the spell that bound her to stone from which she bristled, shaking a hairy black and brown mane of fur, and in tones only he could see her, told the story of the visitor's crossing. Is that so? The god of war grooved, listening to her lowered howling tones. And you can lead me to them, I hear. To which the she-wolf nodded. Oh, well done. I'll drink to that, Mars approved. Lead on. He gave his children's nursing maid as much length as required, trusting none more than this one faithful companion of old. It behooved him to cut short the reunion, but matters pressing to the trail they were tired, and in the dark of midnight forest, by scent and foot the chase transpired. Unaware of the pursuit hot on their tail, Horatio and crew dared to rest until daybreak, a red as ever to boot. Yet, with Grace's fortune, a night's crawl through the forest is slow at best. At pace, they remained ahead a good three hours in their suit. The crew, refreshed twice over for having a few hours of rest, stretched their legs on the inclining slope of an overgrown wilder trail which wrapped along the tree line of eucalyptus, overlooking a crest of cliff to eye fall, a watery shoreline a thousand meters below. Hail! Their souls gave praise for being witness to this brief moment of serenity. In here lie the true magic of the island of Venus, for never would she fail in the moment needed to give cause for pause to admire her beauty. Offerings equal in pleasure and danger, soft, seductive, and vengeful at once, as is the true nature of love's cradle. Athelia, in all her vitality, was the very embodiment of the goddess Venus's idiom. Plentiful, in strength and frailty alike, yet everywhere it was beautiful. Book 24 Of Things, Iron and Bronze There, in a decrepit state, our crew stood to stare at the columned and granite slate temple of Pluto's shrine, tucked into the desolation of this lonely, far-off corner, hidden from eyes both small and great, lost from the memory of existence. Overgrown with weeds and isolation, befitting the last spot one with life would care to visit, this place of worship to the underworld, cold and barren, imbued the want for soul salvation. Perhaps as a sign symbolic of his noble spirit, or maybe as a right-sailing ship would show alignment, Horatio took to a knee, placing it down at the altar, giving the due as would to Caesar. He lifted a silent prayer for safe stewardship of the friends left behind and for safe passage on his journey, so as not to falter on the path. A true distinction it showed in the character of the pagan way to ensure that prayer and homage be given, especially to the gods who'd alter one's fortune over slight or whim. And so Horatio, to great Lord Pluto, did pray, If ever on this path we meet, all I ask is for just a moment you look away. Book 25 To the Gates of Hell Before them stood a pair of massive iron doors, vaulted at the top like a pointed hood. Reinforced with riveted sectionals and embossing scores that portrayed two parallel stories, on the bottom rung from left to right stood an image of the mountain, 
and at the fore is a group of working oarsmen, while, on the other panel, how it begun, was a swirl on the inverse, as would a coiling serpent with many lands and latitudes of being, from mild to menacing, those portrayed were flung upon the landscape for the greater part in misery. Below the center stands a darkened pit of ebony, while rivers snake and octopus carving out the scene. Erebos. Isfit's eyes grew wide. This is a map of the underworld's badlands. You'd be wise to make note of her markings. Here, above on the next screen, is the great bearded Lord Pluto himself, eyes cold here as they are in the flesh. You do well to avoid him. And there, next to this is the god Vulcan, a sheen of psychotic genius and rage held the beveled tones engraved in his thresh. This must be the intersection of where their two domains mesh. Book 26 Entering Erebos On a different track, the war god Mars and his company careened lower into the mine shaft, down a crack in the iron ore and granite foundations to accompany the coppersmith miners, busy with hammer and chisel in hand. Scaffolding straddled a gorge-like mining cave, wide as a valley, abundantly supporting the rail lines that circled and dipped throughout the expand. Finally we come to it. Mars scowled in a foul mood for the opportunity lost. Now they'd have to make up time and distance for which they hadn't planned. Spanning the cavern, the carts slowed of their own accord as they crossed a lengthy bridge to the other side. End of the road, Mars spat from his berth. The triple walls of bronze. Timor spoke with reverence as embossed before their eyes was the barrier separating the underworld from Earth. Impenetrable, Formido's voice trembled with its own sense of dread. Mars shook his head. Well, not really, holding information of worth. Formidable as they may be, these walls were not designed as a bulkhead against entry. Come, he motioned forward. The trail is only cold, not dead. Gently on, morning came across the gate of dawn, as Horatio stepped not into some monstrous frame, but into a fragrant field of wild flowers that covered the hillside, looking out over Elysium the blessed pastures of grace, whose fame was only spoken of in story, but now before his eyes, just on the other side of a calm and placid river. This can't be right, he thought to himself, imagining that he would be surrounded by the dead in morning tide, and all sorts of gruesome demons. Instead, he found misery put on the shelf for some other season, while here fluttered butterflies within his field of vision. It must be some trick. Horatio reconsidered all of what he knew, and the gulf of all what was still unknown, and felt that it might be the wisest decision not to remove his helmet. Book 27 The Pilgrim's Confession Through a clearing, Horatio saw what looked like an enormous sundial veering towards the sky. At the far end of a crooked gnomon, a fashioned triangular blade formed the structure which cast back down the shadow. Horatio stopped and overlooked the scene. If his measurements were accurate, then only a fracture of time had passed. At best he figured it could only be ten in the morning, yet it felt like he'd marched for days. Amazing he thought on the sculpture before him, and then at the base which grew from the ground forming directly out of a natural mound, he saw a lone figure sitting in the grey frock of a monk. That must be him, the shade I seek, Horatio felt hope soaring. Approaching from behind, Horatio looked upon the still figure, taking stock he decided it was safe to proceed, and removing his helmet there addressed the spirit. Are you the one they call the Pilgrim? From his sitting rock, Some have called me that. The spirit responded to the inquest, solemnly without so much as a twitch more to be expressed.
Book 28, Intersecting Roads. Through the gate of shades, Pluto's horse-driven carriage raced the night, passing through the throngs of newly dead ferried by blades of curses and torment. From here is where the plight of the ignorant masses flowed, funneled by way of this port to their final judgment. Trampling past ranks of the departed that light upon the banks of Asheron, the river of woe, where huddled and contorted spirits filed disheveled in their sorrow towards the boatmen. Pluto approached the dock, his steeds neighing at the rolling mist that accompanied their escort carrot, and his ferry across Avernus, the lake of the dead. Here reproached were those waiting their turn, for the master of this realm took precedent over the damned. Welcome back, Karen. In gruff tones encroached his boat upon the landing. It has been some time since your last descent, and frequent were the visits. Yes, I had business in the Judeo-Christian orbit, and this was the nearest portal. Secure my stallions and equipment for the passage home. I care not to dawdle. Obediently, Karen took the bit and bridle, sheltering the team safely aboard his river barge for transit. Book 29, Within the Palace of Hades Across the great plains of suffering, where trapped were the wretched hordes of interest merchants, tormented by thirsty pains after death, did Horatio and Dante pass. The view stretched out beyond the horizon into the infinite haze of dust that swirled around in great clouds, choking the throats of those who in life wretched away the world's resources for themselves alone. Chained by foot, they curled against the biting dust that pecked at their faces. This is where the bankers and speculators are kept, Dante gave the tour. The impoverishment unfurled by their actions, the stripping away of the essentials of life, has led them like cankers to these fields. Here they are always cold and hungry, denied a place to sleep, and just when they think they'll get a moment of rest, along come the rankers of blue demons with sticks to jab them in the side. Look at this heap, balked one of the keepers, ready to throw a kick. Where did you find cardboard? You think you're allowed such luxury? The demon spat, snarling with teeth. Pay it no mind, Dante assured his companion. It's the final reward for their earthly investments. And just, Horatio struck a chord. Book 30, Crossing the River Styx. From high up in the palace, the sounds of barking below could be heard echoing upward. Mars, stirring with aching head, was feeling callous and staggered to the terrace to see what was the matter. Quiet, was the word he mustered, seeing Capitolina acting flustered. And you too, he scolded Timor and Formido, who were busying themselves frightening some curd. Make yourselves useful and stop torturing the already damned. Arms folded akimbo, he turned back away from the balcony's view to then again stumble inside. Oh, my head, he muttered, having spent the last while molded to a table and chair. Now he was worse for wear. At the same time, a rumble was brewing as Pluto likewise awoke from his slumber. What's happened? He wondered aloud, not feeling quite himself after such an unexpected tumble with sleep. Groggily, he sat up. Looks like you tied one on too, Mars penned from behind, re-entering the map room. Indeed. Pluto regained his composure, trying to make sense of the scene, when suddenly his own mood blackened. Sniffing, 
The memory of fragrance came to him, a scent of familiar exposure that he just couldn't place. Chamomile, he finally recalled, now being sure. Bad blood, Mars then said, looking to his goblet. What was that? Pluto asked, already hearing the thud. Bad blood, he reported. Look, it's coagulated, almost like chocolate, showing the dregs of his cup. Eyes narrowing, Pluto sniffed and stood all tense. That's not blood, you idiot. It's elderberries, he spoke of the droplet. Elderberries? Mars took a double take, trying to make sense, while Pluto quickly added up the figures, rushing to his pot, counting herb. Son of a... He muttered and spat, having dropped all pretense. Death turned to war as Pluto asked. This offspring you say you couldn't curb was last seen on Athelia? Book 31 By Fire and Nash The first test of his heightened ability would come much sooner than he'd have guessed. For as they curved the Stygian, there grew a volatility to the waves, just past where the white rocks of Lucius connects the marshes to the river of flame, the Pyrophlegathon, and all her hostility as she flows towards the bowels of hell. The water around them, in context, was bubbling as from underneath the heat began to rise, when by surprise, Flegless declares, The still living had better show himself to me, or the next thing that will happen is I'll deliver the both of you to Pluto myself. With sighs of, What do you mean? Dante deflects, yet to no avail, the jig was up. You think I don't know the weight of my own boat? He scowls and cries, visibly vexed. Look how it drags in the current. There's living mass in my cup. Show yourself now, or you'll only wish to be sent to Tartarus. Discovered, Horatio had no choice but to remove his helmet, yet this was only the wind-up. Once becoming visible to the naked eye, there was a moment that hovered as momentarily stunned, flegless ducked and covered. Book 32 Medusa Storming the gates, Mars drew fast upon Dees to catch the sight of what the fates had decided. There, in a clamor, the Furies were most excited, backing with claws and fangs exposed as would a pack of rats trapped in a corner. Megaria scurries to the rear, pushing Electo forward. What happened here? Mars posed before them a bristled stature, in no humor for kowtowing excuses. He was God! He's risen again! Megaria bawled from the rear, she supposed. By one of his angels, at least! Tisiphone by her sister's side accuses. What nonsense is this? Mars scowls at them, ready to unleash his anger. It's true! Electo backs the other's story. We all heard the abuses, clear as you and I right here. Heard? The god was not amused. <laughs> Sheesh! He held his hand up to silence the background clatter. What do you mean, heard? He looked hard on the Fury Electo. What I said! From her leash she hissed in answer. There was no body, just this booming voice unseen, commanding us to clear the path for the poet Florentine.
Book 33, Baptized in Flame. The secret to harmony was to be able to see the perspective through another's eyes, to be a mirror in fact, an irony that was not lost upon the gods, whose vision, often selective, rarely extended beyond their own walls and desires. How refreshing it was, therefore, when Venus and Mars added Concordia as an elective to the pantheon of the gods, for she alone had the ability inside her threshing to unite the others around a common cause. A being truly in balance between the power of love and the force of war, Concordia, neither timid nor thrashing, was not afraid to fight in combat, yet too held in her the empathy to glean the wisdom of the olive branch. It was said to look into her eyes was to find peace, for in her stare her eyes became the true reflection there to be seen of the other's soul. Translucently variable, her gaze was the mirror to blind her opponent. In the mortal realm what would casually be attributed to luck, for the gods was a vital tool to be wielded, for to ally with her was to bind oneself to victory. Yet. For over a thousand years she'd been missing, struck from all memory of existence. Now her eyes returned, and they were stuck. Before him was a vast pool of fire. All around, in every direction, swim an ocean of doors, and not one to which he could safely retire. Behind you, the voice had called, but all Horatio could see in that direction was the lava pit below. His heart raced trying to make sense of this mire, when through the fire he saw a strange and darkened collection, an image of a fortified archway with massive black doors blocking the entry to some unknown place. The walls, all obsidian, soaked up the reflection of fire bubbling off the moat. Before the gates, the shadow of what he didn't see lurking somewhere in the niches just out of view, there waited an omnibus of pain for him, of that he knew. Just as quickly the vision gone, in a frenzy the fire flicked its flame, as again the voice came whispering softly sonorous. Trust, it said. There and then Horatio understood the meaning to the riddle. His path lie through the flame, a leap of faith if ever there was one so ominous, for if mistaken, even the slightest bit, his remains would be charred and brittle. With a heavy breath he climbed the ledge, tense was the sound of the fiddle. Book 34 the Hundred-Handed Ones. The Hecaton Shears, Brarius the Strong, Kodos the Punch, and Gyges the Curve, were three anarchistic curves as ever there were. If any three could make up a bunch it would be them, for there was a reason why a gathering of baboons was called a congress. The only thing they could seem to agree on was lunch. Then again, with fifty heads each, and just as many hands per side as spoons, they were lucky to share only one stomach apiece, or nothing would ever get done. As it was, when one started the entire buck and a half croons, and then it's a jumbling mess. Bacon! cried one fiftieth of the clever one Gyges. Sure does! An equal proportion of Brarius concurred. Smells like fried a pig! Oh, what I wouldn't give! spoke a head in fever on the shoulders of Kodos, for some nice juicy ribs. All we ever get cornered is bats. And them's just blind chickens. His neighbor nodded, taking a whiff. Yep, like singed little pig hairs. That's what I smells. And it just went forward from there, each in his turn postulating on the menu. From the side of the cliff a rumble of movement came in waves as the Hecaton shears all began to sniff. Book 35 
inside the clockwork of time. Horatio entered the dark prison vault. Off in the distance there centered a warm glow, a brass and golden cobalt, which penetrated the shadows in streaks of refraction. A mechanical hum of rotating drums accompanied a default of clicks and clacks that pinned in a steady rhythmic contraction. Here, in the heart of the machine that regulated the flow of eternity and the passage of countless eons, is where he'd find his prize. The extraction of which was still though in doubt, for the course was anything but a certainty. Spinning cogs and rotating gears made of it a circular journey across. From the center, as if the movement of planets, seemingly still with serenity underfoot, the further outward one reaches, greater the curving arc did toss, with speed that defied all reason. Measured in time, what for one was a second, for the second in that same instant would be a lifetime of years to cross to reach the destination. Horatio, at the very edge and starting point, reckoned there must be some way to traverse this obstacle that beckoned. To look upon such a highway of revolving cogs and blades, if he wasn't sliced in half by one, he'd be crushed by the notches of the other, either way an untimely end for one who has traveled so far. Calming his mind, he spliced a memory, a warning, something his guide Dante had said. This here is a place of great illusion. Do not trust all what spins before your eyes. He priced the words with value. For what was time but not the great illusion, to trace to infinity a singular moment, which may or may not have existed at all. Perhaps this was all just an intricate illusion designed to replace what was real. Yet to know and believe are distinctly different, insisted his mind. The eyes can be betrayed, for what they see they will believe. What if they're only shown a fraction of the evidence? Twisted would become their view, and with it, reality. No, he must weave another path through, one that was in harmony, ruled by the mind. So, calming himself, he let himself breathe, slowly his lungs to heave in a controlled rhythm, and as foretold in the prophecies of mankind, he focused on the light, and now could see he who was once blind. Book 36 To Infinity and Beyond As the infinity glass, prison of Saturn, father of time, shattered and sprayed a trespass of fragments releasing an expanding chime of sands, sparkling effervescent from their confinement, like an explosion, the power of creation spilled forth prime upon the underhaven. Pluto and Mars and all under consignment were frozen to an immovable pause in time, as the universe realigned rebooting such things as wisdom, compassion, and love. With refinement, each god to their core element restored, evolved to a higher purpose of mind, as elemental beings throughout the cosmos, there to influence and guide. Yes, too, Jupiter would get his revenge, and more on that is yet to unwind. For now, let's turn to Saturn, though for in his story there's much to confide. Most of all, Lord Saturn bared a grudge upon all of his children, in particular the three who placed him into his cell. Now released, he would preside over their punishment, which justly he felt it should be both orbicular and long, a revolving cycle as to match his own torment perpendicular. Holding them all the same, each deity guilty in their own degree, for how could any of them avoid the blame of working in their own self-interest? So came the decree. Jupiter, Neptune, and Pluto, the three of you have done me wrong. As punishment and for my entertainment, you will be subject to an eternity of combat against one another, confined to the boundaries of Earth. For as long as it takes for one of you to vanquish the others you shall fight, and to ensure you're constantly at each other's throats, Mars to you will be chained as overseer to keep you in constant turmoil. Be warned, 
for anyone to endure all the way to victory and domination over the others will come at the cost of losing everything you hold dear. And with this knowledge firmly secure, you will still be cursed continually on to battle. And just when all is lost, the pawns will rise against you. And in that moment you'll come to realize the single truth that today is beyond your comprehension as you're tossed to your prison. That your own destinies are tied to the fate of this prize over which you fight and all its inhabitants. Its failure will be your demise. <laughs>